Welcome to Shampoo and Booze, a podcast about Airbnb and short-term rentals at shampooandbooze.com. We are Ryan and Ashley, sisters who run Airbnbs and want to help you run yours. Every week, we cover topics about the design and operation of short-term rentals. Send us your questions with an audio file or written to shampooandbooze at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to cover topics you care about. We are also available to give design and listing advice for your Airbnb or short-term rental. Check out our services page at notperf.com to book a time with us. Okay, welcome to episode number 73. Okay. We are talking about buying property with short-term rentals in mind. Okay, we were just chatting before we started recording about HGTV. <laughs> And how every time I'm in a hotel, I happen to be watching HGTV and uh, how annoying the commercials are. But HGTV is all about uh, real estate. I'm like, they should change the name of this to not home and garden television, which is what it used to be called, and just be called like real estate television. Yeah. And I I mean, anytime we're at our mom's house, HGTV is on and it's like I turn into a zombie. I'm just like... Why did they choose that backsplash? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? They're actually like, there are actually some pretty cute shows on right now. Like there's one called Hometown, which is down in like Laurel, Mississippi, I think. And you're like, wow, they're buying houses for $30,000, which is like, pro- I, I live in a rural area of the country and stuff is not that low. Like that is that... You would be buying like a decrepit, uh, bombed out house for thirty thousand dollars, right? Yeah. But so it's interesting to watch. Or just a piece of land. Yeah, or like barely a piece of land for that much. But it's interesting to watch those shows, um, because and there are some reality TV shows talking about flipping real estate or redoing real estate for short term rentals. Like there's one called Stay Here. Uh, it's it's interesting that that's just part of the sort of conversation about real estate now it's like okay you're gonna buy real estate and what are you gonna do with it yeah and the economy I mean especially in cities people realize I mean this is obviously a problem for a lot of cities is that you can make much more with short-term rentals in cities than you can with long-term rentals so you know when you and I were talking about doing this episode about buying property with short-term rentals in mind you know, for me, it's much more about these rural vacation areas um, because you and I aren't necessarily in the real estate market to buy city property. Um, although you do have an apartment now in a town, so that is slightly different than a vacation property, but it's still a vacation area. It's not like Manhattan. I just wanted to say like that that's our lens a little bit with this episode, much more than, you know, buying a Manhattan penthouse and our Airbnb being that. Right, right. And so, you know, part of this conversation is talking about, and we can get into this briefly in the beginning, talking about different rules and different laws in different places, because you could be in a city that is super short-term rental friendly. I don't know if those exist right now, because I feel like in the last 10 years since Airbnb started, you know, even small cities, there's a small city, it's a college town right near us. It's the nearest like big city and um, they've been cracking down hardcore on short term rentals like they are making people do like a $500 application fee to even just ask if you can have a short term rental. So, you know, there are places like that. But again, kind of like you were saying, there are places that are super friendly um, to tourism or short term rentals for other reasons too. Um, so when you're thinking about buying property, you should be th- finding that out first. And if you're not buying in the area you live, you have to look at those rules and, and ask the towns, ask the city, ask the county and ask the homeowner. If there's a homeowners association, you need to check with them because I live, I live in a neighborhood that has a homeowners association and short-term rentals are not allowed in my neighborhood that I actually live in, um, which we knew going in when we bought our house, which was fine. 
but um, those are number one. The first, honestly, the first thing to look at actually is like, what are the rules here? Is it friendly? I know people in Los Angeles who would have like a little guest house and Los Angeles really cracked down on those people. Um, I think there's probably ways to um, get an application through and do it. But, you know, the hotel lobbies, I think, really crack down in certain cities. So if you're looking outside the cities in suburbs or rural areas, you still want to check the rules. Yeah, and we, we've had a lot of people reaching out to us who, you know, have a family cabin or have a family property in a rural area and, you know, are taking it over or renovating it for short-term rentals. So this is another, you know, way of thinking about you know, a family home or a family cabin that maybe hasn't been rented. So it's like, that's another good reason to get in touch with the town and figure out, you know, what are your limitations there? Yeah. And another thing um, I've heard people say, and we, we can talk about the different ways you can rent properties or different configurations of properties. You know, I've heard people say, oh, I bought a vintage Airstream or a vintage like Shasta camper. I think I think our mom had one of those before. It was like a, you know, 15 foot hard shell camper that would be an amazing little like it's basically like a tiny house, right? It was like the original tiny houses. So, you know, people say like look, in my neighborhood you're not allowed to just have a trailer and back that people can use. You can you can have a, a little like RV trailer that you own. But you can't just have it hooked up and like someone living in it. So, you know, you have to check those rules with your neighborhood and like the health department and like where's the sewage going and, you know, stuff like that. But there are like different configurations of, you you know, short term rentals. So you could buy a house. It could be separate from your house. It's a house in a totally different area or it's in your town or it's nearby or it's next door. You could live in a duplex and you could rent the you know condo or apartment next door. Um, that's a configuration uh, if you're looking to buy a house and and have that house pay pay for the mortgage. There's also something that we recently found out. It's called an accessory dwelling unit or an ADU in like real estate terms, where you would have basically it's like a guest house. It's like it's like a little accessory dwelling unit um, in in your backyard. I I actually have one on my property, but it's my office since we can't do um, short-term rentals here. It's, we use it for eBay storage and for my office for editing video. You have another accessory dwelling unit, the writer's cabin that you have. Right. So at our farmhouse rental, we have, it's like the third bedroom essentially. Now, I think the only technical difference between that and an official ADU is that there's no, there is electric, but there's no plumbing out there. So you couldn't have like a little kitchenette or a, um, or a, or a bathroom. Um, and I think an official accessory dwelling unit is like, there's a, there's a full bathroom and like the ability to have a little kitchenette, which the office I'm sitting in recording this right now, it's, it's basically a studio apartment. So there's a full bath. It's a stand up shower, but it's a full bath. We actually lived in this building while we were renovating our house. So it was like a little studio apartment and we have a little kitchenette. So that's that's like a guest house ADU. People in different parts of the country call it different things. A carriage house, an in-law suite, um, a guest house. We just we were always calling it just a guest house. So there are different terms for that whole like there's another building on your property and people can stay in it. And usually an in-law suite is connected to the house and an accessory dwelling unit is usually disconnected from the house. That's a good point. So an in-law suite could be a a full basement apartment that's totally separate. Like you could rent it out to someone locally and they have an apartment with their own entrance. And I see a lot of those on Airbnb. I mean, basement apartments are super popular. I actually, I really appreciate those units. I feel like when I'm looking at real estate, those are the most interesting to me because, um, and we'll talk about this in a moment, you know, when you're looking at a property, you want to think, okay, what are the short-term possibilities here? But also if short-term rentals don't work out for me or for whatever reason, the area or the rules or the economy changes, 
could this be a long-term rental or could this be a full flip? Right. And something that you've done too, and I know other people, actually a friend of mine has a base, fully finished basement apartment with a private entrance. And what she does is there are certain parts of the year where she can rent between one and three months at a time because there are like visiting nurses. She lives near a university. There are people coming to teach for, for a semester. She'll do short term in the summer when that's not happening, but during the school year, she can do a one to three month rental. So it has the possibility of doing both. She's in an area where she can do that. I I can't really do that. I'm like, I'm all about vacation rentals where we live. Yeah. And that's, you know, I was doing that in Boston because Boston, in my experience, had a very big seasonal shift. You know, once students came in, it was like people really were not renting Airbnbs in the same volume. Right. So those are good things to think about, uh, like how versatile can your property be? Is it a cabin in the woods in a place where you have no market in the winter? Um, You know, that's something to think about. Uh, Or are you making enough money in the summer that it doesn't matter? You know, um, it's enough for you. The other thing to think about, too, is... What is the area that you're looking in? Is it where you live? Is it a different area? And why are you looking in that area? What makes that area special? Like, why are people traveling there? You know, if you know the area, if it's where you live, there's, you know, you know, there's a a huge hospital where people come to teach or to be nurses or to have surgery. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. I've read a bunch of people on Reddit be like, oh, I went to go get a minor surgery and I needed to stay for a week, but wasn't staying in the hospital, you know, vacation rentals, national parks, you know, stuff like that. Why are they coming to the area? What makes it special? Uh, If you were visiting that area, why would you be going there? And even if you think you know a lot about your area, you will learn a lot by looking at Airbnbs in your area. So just searching you know, for two or three people, you know, depending on how big a unit you're looking at, search for that kind of Airbnb, basically look for exactly what you're looking for. Um, And then see what people's rates are, see what people are saying in their listing, you know, close to hiking trails, close to ski mountains, close to hot springs, like whatever the thing is try and hone in on what are the areas where people are renting, which might give you an idea of whether the area that you're looking to buy is already saturated with Airbnbs. Right. And I think it's good to look at the the reviews, read through reviews, look through people's photos and see, you know, what is the quality of the rentals in your air in the area you're looking at? Are they, you know, like there's certain cities in certain areas that you look in, you know, like Palm Springs, like you look in Palm Springs, California, and you're like, there are the most gorgeous, you know, mid-century models, like th- th- there are actual photos of models, like in the pic, and you know, for me, I look at that and I'm like, I could never do that because I just can't compete with the people who are already there. Not to say you couldn't do that. But, you know, it is good to look at your competition and be like, oh, I'm interested in this area or I live in this area and I think I could do a better job and have a a better rental that that could do well here based on what I'm seeing there now. So those are that's good research to do. Yeah. The other thing is, if you are in a really high end area, can you offer a rental? You know, if that's not the market you're trying to compete in, can you offer a rental that's more accessible, but still gorgeous? You know, I feel like that's a a big reason why you and I both got into the Airbnb world is because we feel like, you know, beauty and good design can be accessible. You know, they don't have to be, you don't have to be competing on that huge interior design level. Um, And so I feel like there are still, you know, little areas in the market that people like us can, can um, compete in super high competitive areas. That's a really good point. So it's basically like, you know, if you see a lot of high end places, you can still look good like them, but maybe you can offer a competitive price. Like I'm going to get a piece of property or a duplex or an apartment or something like that, that I can afford in that area and make it look really nice 
and not break the bank, but I could offer, yeah, like a less expensive, less, you know, high end rental. That's a really good point. So yeah, it's, it's just good to look at different areas. Like, it's so funny when I, when I just read different forums and stuff there, there's real estate forums about it on biggerpockets.com, but also, um, just on Reddit, you know, when people are talking about, you know, how do I know what to price my place at? Or how do I know if my place is good enough for the area? And it's like, you just have to look at other people's rentals and look at their pictures, look at their reviews, look at their calendar. Are they booked? You know, I mean, it it helps to look in the high season, but on any season, just see, are they only booked on weekends? Are they booked for like long chunks of time? Do they have, do they have no bookings, you know, and, and why? So we, we do that all the time, even, even just in our local area, like just to compare when things are slow, we're like, are things slow for everyone else? I will go through and look at people's calendars. Cause I'm like, okay, we're just booked on the weekend for X month, you know, February. And uh, so is everyone else. So it's not just us. Yeah. So the other thing to do in looking at other Airbnbs is to look at their rates specifically. So this is a, a little equation that we always do. I mean, you can get really advanced with your equations yeah. <laughs> as we've done, but um, you can just look, okay, what is someone renting, you know, this two to three person Airbnb in the area I'm looking to buy? per night and then guessing, okay, how much of the year are they actually booked? You know, is it a highly seasonal place? Is it just three months a year that they're really booming? Or is it like a really year round location? And then averaging like, okay, well, if they're booked, say they're booked two thirds of the month, you know, for whatever, four months, you know, so you start to get a feel for like, okay, how much could these people actually be booked. I mean, look at their calendar. Sometimes people don't book out, you know, more than three months at a time. So it's, it's hard to sort of look out in the year, but, um, and then, and then start to work towards, okay, what, what could I potentially get from my Airbnb if I were booked, you know, this average amount in this area with this many guests. And then you start to walk backwards and think, okay, what's my mortgage going to be? What's the renovation going to be? If there is one needed, you know, furnishing an apartment is no small task. So, um, which we've talked about a lot, how to, how to source, uh, furniture and design. So I just wanted to like start that equation of like, okay, what would my potential income be here? And does it match what I would put into this place? Right. I think that's the the biggest, biggest thing that you have to start with is do the numbers where, yeah, how much does this, this property cost? Are you building it from scratch in your backyard? Is it a little tiny house that you're going to buy that's, that's, ready to go and costs, you know, X amount of dollars and you just kind of plug it in, (laughs) you know? And so if that's true, how long is it going to take to make that money back? Especially with renovations. I mean, renovations, they take longer and they cost more than you'll ever think. Will it still be worth it? Um, Are you going to hold on to this property for the rest of your life? Uh, How old are you? (laughs) You know, all those factors, you know, I mean, I talk to people who are in their 70s and 80s and they're like, we really want to buy rentals. And it's like, okay, you've really got to do the numbers. Like, are you getting a 30 year mortgage? Like what what makes sense uh, number wise? And uh, yeah, it's just those numbers have to make sense. It, It can't just be like, this is fun and whatever. It is fun and it's fun to do a renovation and it's fun. I think it's fun to run a short term rental uh, and you can make a lot of money. But yeah, you have to you have to make sure you will make money. I you know, I feel like there's this big spectrum, which is, you know, the model that you and Jay have been running is really like buying a property, renovating it and then running it like a small business. And then there's another model or there's another kind of place on the spectrum, which is my partner and I stayed at this great Airbnb, one of my favorites, really all time favorites in Maine on the coast of Maine, which was it was like a tiny house trailer kind of thing. But it was a it was a two bedroom, like 
on a trailer kind of thing. But it was gorgeous. They had done such a good job. It felt very, um, like, Scandinavian. And um, they stayed there part-time. So it was, like, their vacation spot that they then rented out to people. And it was very clear what was for guests and what wasn't for guests. And, you know, it was, like, the best of both worlds, right? Like, they had their own vacation property that they then rented out. And then further down along the spectrum is renting something out that's attached to your own house, whether it's a duplex or a basement apartment, an in-law apartment, or even a room. So I feel like these are the kind of steps and the different sort of extremes we think about when we're looking at properties. Like, how close do I want to be? How much do I want to manage it like a small business? Is it something I want to enjoy myself or is it something that will be strictly for guests? You know, it's like these are these are all places on the spectrum to consider. You know, when you're in Boston and you're there, it's almost like you're having short term roommates. That, that's how close it is. I mean, they're in the same apartment. They're on the other side of the apartment, but you're sharing the bathroom. Like, are you, you know, people yes. got to be like, are you OK with that? Because you know, um, I, there are tons of Airbnbs that you share houses with. Like I, I've seen lots of Airbnbs in the, in the city, uh, especially where they're like, this is our downstairs bedroom. And you're like in their house and, and you can do really well that way. People do, people pay their mortgages that way, you know, and that is an amazing thing to be able to do, but you have to really think, do you want strangers in your house, you know, for me, the answer is definitely not. <laughs> that is not interesting to me at all. I thought about if our if our neighborhood changed the rules, if that ever happened, would I want to rent our back office as a studio? And I actually ran the numbers on it. And I was like, it's not worth it for me. If, if that happened, it, it, it's not enough money to, uh, just take away what I have now and how I use our second building. Um, so, you know, you have to, you have to really be real about it. Uh, you know, do you want, even if you have a guest house or a carriage house or whatever accessory dwelling unit, do you want people in your backyard? Like, are there, are they bringing a dog? Do you have a dog? Do you have cats? Like that, that might not work out, you know? So, and, and again, like you're saying, how far away will you be? Will you be in the same town? Will you be in another city? Will it be in another state? Will you never, ever get there? I have, we have a rental where the rental next to ours, the woman, she's also on Airbnb and um, she lives in Florida full time. So we're in Virginia. She lives in Florida. I mean, she'll email me sometimes and be like, how bad is your driveway? You know, if it snowed. Uh, do you think I need to get it, you know, plowed or whatever? And it's, it's crazy because you're like, she's so far away and, and she just has no connection to it. And some people are fine with that. They're like, I pay a management person 30% or whatever, and I get the rest and I don't have to think about it. And that's cool. But I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I mean, I was at one of my rentals today and I was like, you know, looking at little cobwebs and I'm like, oh, I gotta like do a deep clean on this house because I just can't stand stuff like that, you know? Right. So it's like, what do you have the stomach for? <laughs> Some people would not be able to stand it if, you know, they had to go over and do maintenance every couple months because that's what we, today was a maintenance day. We were doing, I was doing paint touch up and like making sure there weren't like crazy stains on the inside pillows, like, you know? You know, I'm looking at stuff like that because I, I want my rental to be that nice. But, you know, some people are just like, I, I don't have, I don't have the stomach for that or the patience. And you can pay people to do that for you as well. But so something that you had mentioned, uh, considering when looking at properties that I had not even considered is internet connectivity. Tell me what that's about. <laughs> <laughs> what in rural rural America there are lots of places that don't have internet or they have spotty internet or they have like really really slow internet um we bought our second rental and 
I went to the phone company and I was like, okay, you can hook us up. And they're like, yeah, we don't go down that road. And I like had a heart attack basically because I'm like, our rentals, we know our audience or I know who I'm trying to attract. And it's people who want to stream movies. It's people who want their kids to look at the iPad sometimes during dinner. You know, it's people who come out to work for a week and you know, do work and be quiet and hike, but also need to be online. I'm like that. I go on vacation or I go on trips, but I have to be online. Like that's just what my life dictates. Right. So in some ways you are your own audience. I mean, I think of myself that way too. It's like, I go to Airbnbs all the time. Um, and so I'm my own audience. What do I want? What am I looking for? Um, especially in the area, I, I think we had a young couple email us about, um, some property in new England and they were saying, you know, we really are the market. We are it. And we're kind of creating it because there isn't much in this area. And that's, you know, it's a risk, but also it's true. It's like when you build it, they do come. I mean, if there are things in the area that people are going to and they can only access hotels and, you know, little boutique B&Bs, like they will rent your property if it's nice enough. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And, you know, to, to finish what my story about the other house though is we did get internet um we got internet through a different provider who could we had line of sight to a mountain where he has a tower it's like a local internet provider but it was very important for us to have that because it's important to us when we travel i mean i there was one time we were at an airbnb in amsterdam and we were there for like a ridiculous amount of time like 18 days or something and so you are on vacation, but I'm like, I also have to work while I'm here. And the internet was out for three days. I mean, granted, there's like a million cafes and whatever, but we were sort of like, dude, (laughs) first of all, it's pouring rain and it's October. So I'd love to work at home sometimes. And he just didn't respond. Like he literally did not respond. He was like, on a, I don't know, he was away for a couple of days. And finally his roommate who like lived down the hall was like, oh, we can use our neighbor's internet and this is the password. I'm like, oh, dude, you know, so, so you can't, when we, when we first started our rentals here, we live in a rural place where there are lots of rental cabins since the seventies and eighties. And most of the old school people are like, People aren't coming here to watch TV or be on the internet. And so they don't have, you know, streaming TV. They don't have cable or internet in their rentals. And I'm like, cool. I'm really glad you think that because all my places have internet. So people are going to rent from me instead. And it's true. Like people want to watch Netflix. People want to watch the basketball game on their little like app or whatever. You have to keep that in mind, even in rural areas like if you're not a completely off the grid cabin, you pretty much have to have it these days. That and rant. <laughs> I'm done <laughs> and ranting. Rant. Yes. Yes. But uh yeah, I mean those are things to keep in mind. I think it's important to know what level of uh management you want and what level of people in your house you want or in your backyard that you want. And like what level of renovation you're willing to do. That's like not something that we super touched on here, but I feel like those are the biggest key factors. Like what's the, what's the management style and how far are you willing to go on this property? Right. And it's like, if you're looking in different areas, I mean, the numbers that you'll pay for property is going to be different. And the numbers you'll pay for renovation is gonna, can be wildly different depending on where you are in the country. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's all about doing the numbers. I mean, it's like, can you afford the property? Can you afford to build it, buy it or renovate it? Um, we sound like an HGTV <laughs> show. Right? We're back around full circle. <laughs> We're like, so Ashley and Ryan on HDTV. (laughs) Property (laughs) sisters. I feel like we're going to get sued now. Please don't sue us, HGTV. We just gave you so much free advertising. I think we're allowed to talk about HGTV. (laughs) Um, 
Yeah. So, you know, those are things to think about. It's exciting. It's exciting to buy property with short-term rentals in mind, for sure. Like, I'm not done doing it, so we're we're continuing on. <laughs> but the, um, the real estate moguls of ugh, rural Virginia. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, but but look, I mean, we we renovated, like you said, a, a three bedroom apartment in a commercial building on Main Street in a place where it is like cabin cabin world, and we're rented. Like October is busy, so you know you can you can take a gamble. I mean, we were at the point where we had two rentals, and we're like, I think we can safely guess that people come to our area and stay in different types of rentals um you know th- they'll stay in b&b's where they're in a room with like people down the hall so i'm like okay i think i think this will work and it and it has and lacy doilies <laughs> oh god that's like a whole other <laughs> that's a whole other conversation <laughs> can yes. i just say don't use lacy doilies the oh. end and rant <laughs> lacy doilies and like fake roses that are dusty and don't like use on the fake wall. flowers that are dusty stop it oh, yeah. every single yeah. one of you yeah yeah that is that is a whole if you have a, a fake podcast. flower at your house you need to hire us to give you design advice <laughs> if you have any fake um, dude i've been to airbnbs that have fake flowers that are dusty that have like a glade plug in next to them like that's real if you have any of these items at your house please call <laughs> us at 1-800 stop doing that dot com <laughs> serious 1-800-STOP-DOING-THAT.COM yeah (laughs) okay so that's our episode we're wrapping it up and we'll see you next time bye bye thanks for listening to shampoo and booze at shampooandbooze.com as usual you can send us your questions with an audio file or written to shampooandbooze at gmail.com and we'll do our best to cover the topics that you care about Don't forget about our design and listing advice services. Head over to our services page at notperf.com to book your design advice session.